she says in the Red Book that Jung told her, oh, the, let me get the next, um, this is the one, this is Philemon, of course, that um, he, he was sure that Philemon was the same figure that inspired the Buddha and Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, and Christ and Muhammad. All of these figures, of course, communed with God directly. And Jung said to Carrie Fink that Philemon inspired them all. So he's an incredibly important figure because now he appears to Jung in his active imagination. But he says, but she says that he said that these figures, Buddha, Christ, and Mani, and Muhammad, and so on, identified with this figure, with this figure, and Jung refused to do so. He said, I want to remain a psychologist who understands the process. Okay, it's, it's a very important thing. Now, um, I wonder if I've got my pointer back. Oh yes, I've got it back. The gods are very tricky sometimes. <laughs> This, is, this little piece of text over here is very interesting. It's, it's, it's a quotation from the Bhagavad Gita in which Krishna tells Arjuna that uh, Krishna, who is an uh, avatar of Vishnu, that he will, he will incarnate whenever the world is in great need. For, for, for some reason, that is the only piece of text in the Red Book which was originally written in English. It's an English translation of the Gita. I, I meant to look up, I haven't had time to, to know, well, there must have been German translations of the Gita. So why Jung used an English translation, I don't know, but that is in English, in the original. And the, the implication seems to me to be that this is one of those new uh, kind of incarnations, that something new is emerging into the world because the world is in difficulty. That's why I think Jung put that quotation there from the Gita, next to, next to the painting of Philemon. Um, and those are uh, kingfisher wings, the wings of the kingfisher, which Shakespeare calls the halcyon, from which we get our, he used the, the, we get the, used the phrase halcyon days, because in the fisherman's law, the kingfisher, the appearance of the kingfisher was associated with peace and calm seas. That seems to be why Philemon has kingfisher wings, I think. And there's a, a story which may be apocryphal that just when Jung had done this painting that a dead kingfisher washed up on the shore of the lake sort of synchronistically. But these kind of things happen to Jung all the time. But it's hard to tell if that's true or not, of course, because there's so much mythology around him. But um, Anyway, um, I think this is the same figure that's mentioned in the Gita. I think that Jung thought it's the same figure, or they're related in some way. So Jung, it sounds to me as if Jung could have decided to become a kind of religious prophet. But he instead, he spent the rest of his life using this material to enrich the field of, of psychology. He never really identified with it. And that's why I don't think it's quite fair to accuse him of inflation. <clears throat> but in spite of that, a lot of critics have accused him of starting a new religion. In Kerr's book, uh, Dangerous Method, Kerr says, Jung wants to develop a new religion because he wants to justify the betrayal of his wife and the seduction of Sabina Spielrein. And Jung needs to conceive a better religion that wouldn't, wouldn't condemn him for his sins. Okay. So I went through several biographies, and you know, we all have a shelf full of biographies. M McLean's biography says Jung was a prophet, and his followers developed the legend of Jung as a man god. Heyman's biography says that Jung speculated like a prophet and so on and so on. Now, the extreme example of this, of course, is Knowles' description of Jungian psychology, quote, as an anti-Orthodox Christianity, anti-Orthodox Christianity cult of redemption, or a Nietzschean religion, a secret church, a pagan form of personal religion. Knowles says that Jung is waging war against Christianity and its unreachable God, and he's training his disciples to listen to the voice of the dead, worship the sun, and become gods themselves. It's quite amazing. We are witnessing the incipient stages of a faith 
based on the apotheosis of Jung as a god-man. Only history will tell if Jung's Nietzschean religion will finally win its Kulturkampf, its struggle with culture, and replace Christianity with its own personal religion of the future. It's really, Knoll's criticism is quite amazing. Knoll says that, um, according to Jung, the only way to overthrow the neurosis-inducing Judeo-Christian religion and its sex-fixated ethics is to start a new religion, the religion of psychoanalysis. And so there's this secret church which is spreading, which I guess you didn't realize you were members of. <laughs> And, and Noel says, Jung has developed his psychological method and organizational plans along an ancient mysteries model, recruiting former patients and Jung worshippers, primarily women, to be the high priests of his new religion. <laughs> he's fueling the widespread fascination with witchcraft and the occult, and he's a source of inspiration for the neo-pagan religious movements, and so on and so on. Um, unfortunately, I missed that piece in my training. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I, I was quite disappointed when I read that. I, I thought maybe I was away on that day or something. But <clears throat> well, it was last night. <laughs> yes. Now, um, oh, sorry, that's um, just this one, yeah. Noel's accusation, I think, is based on an active imagination based... Um, this is found in the Red Book on page 252. In this act of imagination, there's a big black serpent at Jung's feet. And he sp Jung spreads his arms wide in an identification with Christ. And then Salome comes near, and the serpent winds itself around his body, and Jung's face is transformed into a lion. And Salome tells him that he is Christ. Okay? Now, uh, and that, of course, sounds an, like another monumental inflation. Now, in the 1925 seminar, Jung talks about this. And he says, Salome's worship of him is that side of the inferior function that is surrounded by an aura of evil. He says, this experience feels like madness, and it is madness, but one has to surrender to the unconscious. These experiences are part of the ancient mystery schools. So this was a symbolic deification. He is transformed into the Deus Leontocephalus, the lion-headed god of the Mithraic mysteries. This is, you know, is the frontispiece of Ion, volume 9, uh, shown there. Um, the snake coiled around a man with the head of a lion, with the face of a lion. In other words, in this act of imagination, He's, he's initiated into both Christianity and Mithraism at the same time. And so that has important symbolic meanings because, of course, Mithraism and Christianity were competing traditions at the time of Christ. Um, uh, many Romans um, adhered to the religion of Mithra. So here the initiate becomes a vessel in which these opposite, opposites are reconciled in one person, uh, which is one of the functions of the true symbol, to reconcile opposites. Now, in this seminar, he, Jung goes on to say that when these images arise and you don't understand them, you are either in the society of the gods or the lunatic society. Okay. Now, obviously, um, Jung took this as a symbolic experience. But... Noel says that this is the experience that when Aniela Jaffe wrote her memories, she deliberately suppressed this because she didn't want it to become public. And Noel says that Jung believed that he had actually become deified, turned into a god, and, and he'd become an Aryan Christ. Okay. Um, or that he and, and that now he was immortal. And that this lion-headed god is his image of a, of a sort of secret image of an inner god. And Noel says that Jung and his followers realized this truth and concealed it from the world. This is really uh, astonishing because Noel is, is, is obviously a very gifted intellectual, but this critique completely fails to understand the meaning of a symbol and a metaphor and an image. It freezes and concretizes what is really a symbolic experience. 
as if Jung was taking it literally. Jung never took this kind of stuff literally. Um, no rights as if Jung believed it was a literal permanent transformation into a god. It wasn't. Jung is very clear. It's a symbolic initiatory experience. He analyzes the experience. He doesn't identify with the experience. So Jung, so Noel is wildly exaggerating Jung's effect on his followers. I, I know quite a lot of people who over-idealize Jung, but they don't worship him. So Noel is trying to prove that Jungianism is what he calls Jungianism, is not psychotherapy and it's not philosophy, it's a Nietzschean religion, it's an Aryan's only cult of redemption and rebirth. That would let me out. Um, now, this is, I don't think this fantasy shaped Jung's self-understanding for the rest of his life. I don't think Jung took it literally. Um, I think it's true that Jung thought that numinous experiences are forms of revelation. I think it's true that he thought that these experiences can possess people and inspire them to think that they're prophets. But he often warned that you must overcome the... When you've had contact with this level of the psyche, you mustn't become godlike. You mustn't set yourself up as a prophet or a world redeemer. He says this in several places. So he's very aware of the danger. And in the Zarathustra seminars, he, he frequently points out that if you identify with the numinous, this is very dangerous. He says he thought that's what happened to Nietzsche. So Noll is constantly, Noll is ignoring the fact that Jung constantly warns about this. Um, so there is an identification with Christ, momentary, but this for Jung, as I said before, means living your life truly as Christ lived his. It means individuation, it means the incarnation of the self. It doesn't mean just copying Christ in some external sense. 